so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a kind of complicated sounding title, Parallel to First Group Genetics, Bolt Stewardship. Um, and since this session is quite long, what I thought I'd do is I'd divide the first part into really sort of introducing the field and the advancements that have been made, and the second half really focusing on research projects that I personally have been involved in. Um, so first of all, just to introduce the lab, where we work and who we are. So if you go into the blurb of our, our website, you'll find um, a very long paragraph detailing everything that we do. This is our boss volunteer with the army. Um, but really what we do is develop advanced optical methods in order to probe neural function. So uh, essentially, this is where we are in neuroscience right now. And the approach of our lab is to use optical tools in order to discover how the brain works, find the, the, the fundamental principles of computation. And sort of the modern approach of neuroscience is to, is to think of us as existing in the world where we have a lot of things bombarding our senses. So we see things, we hear things, we smell things. But at the same time, we also have an internal state, which is how we're feeling at any given time. And that also depends on our history. And the question is, is how does the brain integrate all of the sensory bombardments and the internal state in order to, to, to perform behavior. Um, and the current uh, hypothesis is that there's a lot of computation. The, the brain is a computer, basically. The brain takes these inputs, does some computation, and we arrive at an output. And so the, 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 the tools that we develop is really to probe these input-output interactions. So we want to be able to develop tools in order to manipulate neurons and to, to perturb the activity in order to understand how is the brain performing as a computer. Um, so we'll go into some basics of neuroscience. So as we all know, the brain is composed of a large number of different cells, but the main ones that we're interested in are neurons. Um, and there's a so-called neural doctrine, which states that Basically, the neuron is the most important cell in the brain. It's the structural and functional unit of, of the nervous system. Um, and there are, neurons have a few properties. Um, so basically, neurons are connected to one another by things called synapses. Um, but they're not every neuron is connected to every other neuron. Um, neurons are connected in very specific patterns. And that's one of the things we want to find out, which neurons are connected to which other neurons, and why is that important? And neurons communicate with each other um, by these uh, synapses. Um, and an, another important aspect of neural information is that transmission only ever happens in one direction. So it's feed forward. Um, and then the, 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 a, new, a single neuron can receive many analog inputs. And if the, the sum of those inputs exceeds a certain threshold, then an all or nothing event is evoked. This is called an action potential. Uh, and it's the timing of these action potentials that is extremely important. Um, and as I mentioned before, not all neurons are connected to all of the neurons. Essentially, brains are formed of assemblies of different types of neurons, which perform different tasks. Um, and the, 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 the communication between neurons happens at synapses, which are these chemical junctions. Um, and the chemical junctions are either excitatory or inhibitory. So one neuron either excites the subsequent neuron or it inhibits its subsequent neuron. And essentially what's happening at these synapses is the flow of ions across the cell membrane. And according to the polarity of the ions and the direction in which they flow, that dictates whether the, the connection is excitatory or inhibitory. Um, and essentially, it's the sum of all of these signals which dictates what a neuron will do. And what is important about these signals is not only their directionality, but also their location on, this, on a so-called postsynaptic cell. So if we have excitation and inhibition close together, so these are two different synapses, what ends up is that the activity is vastly reduced. Whereas if the inhibition is a bit further away, then the excitation is not really perturbed by, by the inhibition. Um, so what, what's important here is that a single neuron cannot perform the task of a brain. A single neuron 
receives some inputs and fires an output. So what is it that makes these assemblies of neurons be able to allow brains of humans to perform complex tasks? tasks. So what, how do we go from this movement of ions across cell membranes to brain function, collaborative brain function? Um, and that's sort of one of the major problems in modern biology. So this is Francis Crick, who is famous for discovering the structure of DNA. But actually, in the, at the end of his life, he kind of became obsessed um, with this problem of how brains work. Um, and he was quite a clever man. And over a period of time, he proposed a lot of methods of how to kind of address these problems. Um, and one of them, uh, one of the things that he said was that in order to understand the biological system, it's necessary to be able to interfere it with it precisely and delicately at all levels. And what he means by all levels is all scales. So going from the synapse to the neuron, to the entire brain as a whole. Um, and that should be done at the cellular and molecular levels. Um, and he and many others have proposed that light is basically an ideal tool to be able to provide this precise uh, perturbation. Um, and why is that? It can be non-invasive. It can be spatiotemporally precise. It can be spatiotemporally flexible. It's multiplexible. So as we all know, there are lots of different properties of light, different wavelengths and polarizations. Um, and crucially, it can basically be used to target all of the scales that we're interested in. So right down from these synapses, which are the connections between neurons, all the way up to recording how humans and rodents interact in the world. So basically, we can use light at all of these scales in order to record what's happening. Um, and one thing that became extremely important in this field is that optical tools can be readily combined with genetic targeting in order to provide a precise motivation. So basically, the combination of photonic technologies and genetic targeting spurred the, fuel, the field known as optionetics. That's a field within which work. And this field is based on three technological advancements. So the first was the, the, the finding of light gated ion channels. The second was the packaging and delivery of these genetically encoded tools. And the third was methods of light delivery. Um, and the discovery of light gated ion tools is kind of a fantastic example of the use of basic science. So um, I'll go in a bit into a bit more detail about the discovery and then subsequent application of these light gated ion channels. So basically, uh, 40 years ago, um, scientists were studying algae, and algae, or certain types of algae, uh, display a very interesting behavior, which is that they move in response to light. So basically, they want to find the best spot to perform photosynthesis. And so, how uh, scientists were kind of interested in how on earth do they do that? How do they sense where the light is coming from and therefore move? And after decades of work, um, scientists found that actually what was happening is that in the membranes of these of these algae in a, a, a part of the the cell called the eye spot there are these proteins that is that are light gated ion channels so what's happening is that when you shine light on these ion channels they open up and allow um, ions to flow um, and so this is just a quote from from one of the the, the pioneers of this field um, so basically, they were studying the molecular mechanisms of phototaxis of single celled algae. And now these tools have sort of revolutionized neuroscience, um, which I find uh, a sort of nice ode to the point of doing nothing in a, in a science research lab. Like, so people always say that we should be doing applied research. We should always make sure that we're working on problems that are relevant today. But actually, if we work on fundamental scientific questions, in the end, the rewards can be huger than we ever imagined. Um, so I think that's a particularly important message for masters. So, uh, so what happened was, and uh, these tools were taken up by another field, so neuroscientists, who took these tools and used genetic, uh, genetic uh, editing tools in order to so-called express these cells, these um, ion channels in neurons. So basically what you're doing is taking neurons and making them sensitive to light. Um, so when you shine light on, on neurons, 
ions flow through the channels, and therefore you can control the activity of neurons with light. Um, so this was from the first paper that, that demonstrated that this was possible, which was published in, in 2005. Um, and so in the top, you have this image of the, the, the neurons, which are now expressing this, um, the, the, this channel reduction, this light-sensitive ion channel. Um, and you can use electrical methods to measure the current flowing in and out of the cell. So essentially here, when you shine light on the cell, you generate a current in the cell. And just by shining light on the cells, you can evoke these action potentials, which are, are responsible for, for communication uh, between neurons. Um, and since the discovery of the first channel reduction, there's been a huge engineering effort in order to, to generate different types of light sensitive ion channels, um, which are sensitive to different ions and also to different wavelengths and have different kinetics. And so this is called the optogenetic toolbox. And developing and changing these tools is really an active, it's an active research area, area to this day. Um, so the next question is, how actually are we getting these into, into cells? How are we getting cells to express these artificial channels, which typically aren't there? You've probably heard of gene therapy, it's been in the news a lot. Um, and basically using viruses, um, you, can, you can get a, a cell to express a foreign gene. And the foreign gene is this thing. So it's generally formed of a promoter, a gene for the protein, and a targeting sequence. And the promoter basically tells the, tells the, 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 the cell body whether to express it or not. So you can express your tool of interest in a subset of cells that you're interested in. So for instance, excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons or cardiac cells or skin cells. So this promoter basically means that your tool is only expressed in the cells that you're interested in. Then after the promoter, there's the gene for the protein. So this is the, the genetic code that tells the, the cell what protein to generate. So in our case, it's, it's light sensitive ion channels. Um, and then the final part of this, uh, of, 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 the, of the gene that is expressed is a targeting sequence. So this tells the cell, okay, I want this uh, protein to be in the cell membrane. I want this protein to be in the nucleus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these tools are really quite specific now. So basically by injecting uh, mice or, or any model organism that you like, even humans now, um, you can get very reliable and precise expression of the tools that you're interested in in the regions that you're interested in. And so this genetic specificity is crucial to, to an optogenetics. Because in order to probe brain function, in order to probe which neurons are important for which tasks, we need to be able to precisely deliver our tools into those cells of interest. And that's done uh, by gene targeting. So the third thing that we need for optogenetic experiments is light. So we need to, now we've got these tools which allow us um, to make neurons sensitive to light. We've got the tools to deliver um, those channel reductions into cells. Now we need to deliver light into the, into the brain, which is where, where our lab comes in. So the first experiments were done with single photon excitation. Um, so just to, to, to recap, I guess, in your master's course, you love study single photon excitation. So what's happening is that these photosensitive molecules um, absorb one photon, which um, excites them into a, a higher energy level. And in the case of the channel reductions, what's happening is that this absorption of a photon induces a conformational change. So this absorption of a photon causes the ion to open and therefore um, differently charged ions can pass through. Um, for single photon excitation, basically the absorption rate is independent of my axial uh, position. So um, there's no axial discrimination. Every time a photon hits an ion channel, there's a chance that it'll be absorbed um, and the channel will. Um, so what that means in the brain is that everything that's expressing these genetically encoded channels will be activated as soon as we, we shine light, which was very ex exciting the first time that the researchers observed that. Um, but if you imagine, this is very, very unphysiological. This has absolutely nothing to do with the activity patterns that actually are happening in the brain. It's more like um, 
a monkey uh, clanging some, some symbols in your brain. Every time that you shine light, a huge number of neurons are activated simultaneously. So we need something a bit more precise. Now we have genetic targeting, but we want also to have optical targeting. Um, and the tools that allow us to do that, uh, sorry, um, so just to give you a bit of background as for why um, we don't want, or in most cases, we don't want highly synchronous activation of all of the neurons that are addressing, uh, that are expressing these genetic tools. Essentially, the sort of, I would say, most popular theory of brain function at the moment is this so-called manifold theory, which states that of all the possible spiking patterns that all of the neurons in your brain could do, only a subset of those are actually used. So at any given moment, your brain function is so-called on manifold. So it's, it's doing very low dimension, dimensional tasks on the basis of what it actually could do. And when we apply these single photon plans of light, you're, you're moving off manifold. So you're moving away from the physiological behavior of the brain. So in order to be more precise, we use two photon excitation. So in this case, it's the same transition or roughly the same according to the rules of quantum mechanics. But this time we use two photons, which each have half the energy of the, the single photon in order to excite um, the molecule in, into the higher energy level. And this time we obtain intrinsic optical sectioning because basically this process only happens if two photons arrive at the same time in the same place. And therefore, this process is a function of the photon density squared. So the probability of this process de decreases away from the focal plane. So you only get excitation where the photon density is sufficiently high that the probability of this process happening is not negligible. Um, and this also has some, the, the, aside from the intrinsic op optical sectioning, because it's an unlinear process, Two photon excitation has some other advantages, which are that because the, the wavelengths used are double, these propagate longer in the brain. So they have so called longer scattering lengths. So using two photon excitation, we can reach deeper brain regions. Um, however, if we now are using diffraction limited spots, our, our, our excitation is confined just to this focal region. This isn't going to help us spike our neuron because essentially there's too few of these light sensitive ion channels within this spot. So actually we're going to excite some current, but not enough to perturb the activity of the neuron. Um, and so there are two methods uh, that you could use in order to overcome this limitation. And these are both used in, in research today. So one is just to, to, to scan this spot very quickly. So using galvanometric mirrors or acoustic optical devices in order to scan a cell extremely quickly and in order to open all of the channels on the cell so that you can integrate the current with all of them. The approach that's taken in our lab is slightly different. Um, it's parallel excitation. Um, so what we actually do is we excite all of the ion channels in the cell at the same time. So, and we do that by expanding this size of the region of excitation. Um, however, as I uh, guess in this room everybody knows, when we increase the lateral dimension of a beam, intrinsically, we also increase the axial dimension of the beam. So we've lost this axial resolution that we, that we uh, were hoping for. Um, and I'll just, I'll just give you a brief overview of one of the methods that we use to expand the size of the beam laterally, which is computer generated telegraphy. Um, so in this case, uh, we use spatial light modulators. So liquid crystals, uh, arrays of liquid crystals in order to manipulate the phase of, of the beam in order to generate a pattern in the shape that, that we want. Um, and how do we know what phase we need at the SLM? We use iterative algorithms, so Gertberg, Saxon, and the like, um, in order to, to, to deduce what phase master will give us the target pattern um, that, that we'd like. Um, 
But as we're creating these extended patterns, we go from a sort of 14 micron resolution, which is roughly the size of a single cell, to something like 40 microns. So now where we're targeting single cells, actually we're going to be exciting neurons above and below the, the target cell. So um, we had to come up with uh, an approach in order to, to overcome this, um, this problem. And the approach that, that, that was used was also taken from a different discipline. So um, we use a, a, a method called temporal focusing. And so for two photon excitation, Basically, we use pulse lenses in order to deliver the high peak intensities that we need in order to generate, uh, in order to, to increase the probability that we'll get to a photon excitation event in our process. So if you were to place a photodiode here, you would see these pulses arriving. Now, in order to generate short pulses, we have to expand the spectrum of our, of our beam, right? We'll call this, 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 um, this uh, uh, for instance, 1030 nanometer laser, but actually it's 1030 plus or minus about 10, minus, 10 nanometers. Um, and so now, if we place a diffraction grating in a conjugate image plane of our center, what the diffraction grating does is spreads the colors of the beam. Okay? It spreads them in all parts apart from the image plane, which is, of course, the image of the grating. So they're recombined here. And now if you were to measure the pulse away from the focal plane, you would find that the pulse duration is much longer, right? Because in this part, all of the colors are separated. So it's like we're propagating each wavelength uh, along a, a different path. And because each wavelength has a different path length, the probability that two photons from two different wavelengths will arrive at the same point at the same time is negligible. So by using temporal focusing, reduce the probability of excitation away from the focal plane. So it's called a, a time lens. Um, and so this is just to, to, to give you um, the classic two-photon excitation, which is where we spatially focus a beam in order to make sure that we, we have a non-legible probability of excitation in the focus. In temporal focusing, what we do is we expand the duration of the pulse um, away from the focal plane to make sure that only in the focal plane do we have the short pulses necessary to excite to an excitation. There's another way uh, that we can think of to explain this phenomenon, um, which is line scanning at the speed of light. So take my instant beam. If I were to put a mirror here, my beam wouldn't go into my microscope. It would be totally diffracted. Uh, reflected away. Now, if I replace this with um, a grating, at any given moment, what I my intersection between my beam and the grating is a line. So, at any given moment, I have a line here and a line here. And now, of course, my actual resolution is improved because there's just no way that photons um, will arrive here and arrive here to excite two photon excitation. Um, and here's a little video that I hope will play that shows that temporal focusing is basically a, a line scanning at the speed of light. Um, and what that, what that allows us to do is take these um, long beams, which are exciting neurons that we don't want to excite, and we increase their axial resolution so that we only get non legible axial resolution in the focal plane of the microscope. So just by replacing this mirror here with a grating, we go from having no axial resolution, basically, to having an axial resolution, which is independent of the lateral side of our spot. Um, and so here's some, some uh, graphs kind of, kind of showing this decoupling between lateral beam shape and axial beam shape. Um, and so here, this, these are the axial profiles of different sizes of spots. Basically, what's happening is as we increase the size of our spot, the axial resolution is getting worse and worse and worse. Whereas when we use temporal focusing, essentially what's happening is that the axial resolution is, is independent. So it doesn't matter what shape that we have, the axial resolution is the same. We can still target these single neurons. Um, so this is what a typical microscope looks like. So the first um, stage is the light sculpting. So this is usually with the SLM that we use to perform generated holography. And then we usually have a, uh, so here's a grating for temporal focusing. And then we also usually have a second um, SLM, 
in order to perform multiplexing. And on the second SLM, we basically um, generate a phase pattern that sends light to the neurons that we want it. So we don't typically want to just record from or to perturb the activity of one neuron at a time. Uh, we want to perturb um, multiple. So we perform what's called point cloud holography. Um, and then what we actually end up with on our sample are these arrays of spots. I hope this video will work. Um, so basically the combination of the, the multiplexing, the temporal focusing, and uh, the computer generated holography allows us to generate points of light that are well separated from each other, right? There's no overlap between distinct points. So we're not generating any out of focus uh, excitation where we don't want it. Um, and we can do that in 3D. So we can now manipulate light to generate patterns in 3D. And so now this, this means that we can form much more precise optogenetic experiments. So we've moved away from the case where we're shining a, a, a wide field excitation and we're exciting everything uh, that, 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 that they hit to this to, to now where we can look at the natural activity of neurons um, and then dictate where the light goes at any given time in order to replay these precise patterns of neural activity. Um, and so this is a video of, of, of precisely that. Um, so basically this is a uh, two photon uh, calcium imaging. Um, so there's a genetically encoded fluorescent reporter that's, that's blinking every time that the neuron is firing. Um, and also then we're targeting neurons with our light and every time that we target them, the fluorescence increases. Um, So hopefully you can, you can see that when we target them with light, that you see a flash, a flash of light, and that means that, that we've activated the neuron. So now we're using light in order to perturb the activity um, of these neurons. Um, so what people say, and it's a very bold claim, is now that we can use these tools to play the piano with the brain. So we can basically, at any given moment, activate different neurons um, at will. Um, and what I'll now talk about two different projects uh, that I worked on during my, my postdoc. Uh, and the first is bi-directional manipulation of neural activity using light. So in this, uh, in this project, we wanted to activate and inhibit neurons. Uh, and in order to do that, we basically needed to use a tool. Uh, so one of these engineered tools that is covalently combined. So in this tool, we have a channel rhodopsin that can inhibit neurons and a channel rhodopsin that can excite neurons and they're covalently bonded so that every cell is expressing a, an exact ratio of excitatory and inhibitory opsins. And so what this tool allows us to do is with one wavelength to excite neurons and with one wavelength to inhibit neurons. Um, and this is a really powerful tool for, for, for neuroscience research, right? Because now you can, you can probe what happens when I don't have activity and what happens when I do. And you can do that in a very precise manner because you're always targeting the same cells. Um, so here in single photon excitation, the inhibition is performed at 490 nanometers and the activation is performed at, at 600 nanometers. And so basically this is showing that when I shine red light on the, on the cell, if I shine pulses of light with every pulse, I'm generating natural potential in the cell. And for the inhibition here, they're, they're injecting uh, current into the neurons to cause them to spike. And when they add increasing intensities of blue light, the spiking activity is diminished. The spiking activity uh, is, is gone. You're inhibiting, you're inhibiting the cell. And so uh, our role in this work was to demonstrate that this was also possible using two photon excitation. Um, so this is the, the setup that we used. So we basically have a tunable laser. Um, we have um, a power control here. We have a dipoic, which allows us to combine the two wavelengths. So remember, we need two wavelengths uh, to excite and inhibit. 
Um, and then we use the spatial light modulator in order to perform holography, so to generate these holographic spots. Um, and we're able to generate holographic spots between 850 and 1100 uh, nanometers. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so the first step was to express this genetically encoded, uh, this, uh, genetically encoded uh, light sensitive ion channel in neurons. This is just a fluorescence image of the cells that are now expressing this tool. Um, and in order to characterize these tools, we, we rely on electrical methods. So we rely specifically on a tool called whole cell patch plant, um, which honestly is performed by extremely brave biologists. Um, because what's happening is that uh, so this is a, a cell, this is a patch clump. And so you very precisely move a glass pipette towards your cell in order to gain electrical contact. Um, and it's a very precise finicity method. Um, so we're very grateful that we have a team of biologists who are willing to do it. Uh, and what this allows us to do is record the electrical activity so we can directly see what's happening when we shine light in the cell. Uh, so it's often used as a as a characterization step before we move to the so-called all optical approaches. Um, and so using these electrical recordings, we were uh, I should have also mentioned that um, whole cell using whole cell patch plant electrophysiology, you can actually precisely control the cell membrane. So usually a neuron is resting at about minus 70 millivolts. Um, but when during activity or excitation and inhibition, the membrane voltage changes. So what the what the patch cell, the patch plant is allowing us to do is to change the resting potential and to see how this affects uh, what happens to the flow of ions when we're shining light. And so you can see that when we shine 920 nanometers, essentially we generate both uh, inhibitory and excitatory currents according to the holding potential of the cell. Whereas when we shine uh, 1100 nanometers, uh, we only generate excitatory currents. And so what that tells you is that there's some crosstalk between the 920 and, and 1100 nanometers, but actually that's okay because the crosstalk happens when we're working at non-physiological brain potentials. So what this told us was that there was enough separation, even though there's some crosstalk, that would allow us to use two different wavelengths to either excite or inhibit the cell. Um, so we can probe at many different wavelengths as well. So um, at minus 80, we only generate inhibitory currents, whereas uh, at, at minus 55, at minus 60, we basically get this action spectrum. This tells you what you're doing to the neuron as a function of the, the wavelength that you shine. And the reason that we chose 920 and 1100 nanometers uh, are because the peak uh, inhibition occurs at, at 920 nanometers and the peak excitation at all holding potentials occurs at 1100. And so now we can repeat these types of experiments where the the, the patch clamp electrophysiologist is now exciting activity in the neuron. And then when we shine uh, 920 nanometer light, we basically wipe out these action potentials. So you can see here when there's just current injection, this is what's happening in your neuron. Here we have current injection and light indicated by these uh, pulses. And whenever there's a pulse of light, we basically wipe out the activity from that neuron. Um, and you can study how much light you need, uh, what happens as you increase the amount of light, um, et cetera. And so whenever we use these tools, there's a, there's a, a large amount of characterization. And so what happens at 1100 nanometers? Now we're just recording. The electrophysiologist is, is, not, is not injecting current. So the cell is, is, is just at its normal membrane potential. Then when we shine 1100 nanometers light on the cell, we evoke a, a, an actual potential. Um, and we evoke action tensors in, in a reliable manner. So this is the pulse of light, and you can see that there's a short latency. So that's the time between light onset and the average uh, point at which the action potential is evoked. And there's the jitter, which says it's a standard deviation of the onset of the action potentials. And the reason that we want these to be very precise is that if we want to replay naturalistic um, patterns of, 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 of neural activity, um, we need to be able to be sure that every time that we shine light, 
within a reasonable amount of time, we generate an action potential. And what happens when we shine 1100 nanometers and 920 nanometers at the same time? Uh, essentially, the, the, the inhibition wins um, and, and we, we rinse out all of the action potentials. Um, okay, so the second project uh, that I worked on was scanless two photon pulse imaging. So now I've shown you that we have tools that are able to perturb neural activity, um, but we also want to be able to record neural activity. Um, and so again, Francis Prick gave us an indication of, of how this might be possible. Uh, and he said that basically the best way to do this would be to engineer neurons so that one of, when one of them fires an action potential, it emits light and you follow the light and it tells you, okay, whenever the light was shone or you, whenever you detected light, um, that, 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 that neuron was doing something. And he called it, he lived in California for a while, so he called it a way out suggestion. Um, but actually, um, it's now possible um, using what are called genetically encoded Baltic indicators. Um, and so the idea behind these tools is that basically they transduce uh, changes in membrane potential into changes in fluorescence. Um, and to just go into a bit more detail, so back to our single photon and two photon. Um, before, when we excited uh, molecules, we introduced a conformational change, which opened this channel and allowed ions to flow. Now what's happening is that um, we excite uh, the, 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 fluorescent, the fluorescent protein, but now when it relaxes to the ground state, it emits a, 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 a photon. And usually those photons are at longer wavelengths, so there's a Stokes shift between the excitation and the, the, the emission. And basically, um, when there's a voltage change, um, the amount of fluorescence that's emitted is modulated. So um, when the voltage increases, the fluorescence increases. And so these tools allow us to track uh, neural activity, but they're very complicated to use. And the problem with them is that action potentials occur on millisecond timescales. And voltage responsive indicators are membrane localized. So remember that neural activity depends on the flow of ions across membranes. So if our indicators are not located in the membrane, they're not telling us what the issue that we're interested in. Um, the signals that we want to detect are very fast, so they occur on milliseconds timescales, and they originate from very few immobile fluorophores. All of which is to say that we're operating with an extremely limited um, so if we were to use wide field microscopy in order, in order to do this, essentially because we're exciting fluorescence from all throughout the, the, the brain, what we'd see on our detector would be the sum of the fluorescence that is excited in all of these planes. So essentially we would get a very low contrast uh, image on our detector. Um, this can be overcome somewhat using genetic tools, so you can uh, improve the sparsity of the, of the, the technique, uh, but then you're losing neurons. So basically, then only a subset of your neurons are expressing the tool that you're interested in. So another way is to induce sparsity optically using these light patterning methods that I, that I mentioned earlier. So the general scheme of these techniques is that firstly you acquire a reference data set to so use a high resolution imaging technique like microscopy, like two photon scanning microscopy, to acquire a reference, a reference data set. Then you select the neurons that you're interested in recording at any given time, and then you target light to them so that you record fluorescence selectively only from those neurons. And there are three methods that we generally use uh, to, to, to do this. One is generalized phase contrast. Uh, one is Gaussian beams, and one is generated Kelvin beam, which I uh, described earlier. And again, we use temporal focusing with all of these methods in order to ensure that we have good axial confinement, and so that we have high contrast imaging of the fluorophores that we're interested in. Um, okay, um, this is what the spots look like. So you can see that there's some differences uh, between the approaches. So uh, the biggest difference is that with computer generated holography, 
um, because of some of the nuances of how we generate the phase masks to generate these spots, we get a uh, speckle. Um, whereas with generalized phase contrast and Gaussian beams, the intensity profiles are, are very small. Um, and so those are nuances, but they actually affect uh, the performance that I'll get into later. So again, we use patch pump electrophysiology to, um, in order to characterize these techniques. So here, what the, the patch pump who is uh, a patient student in my mentor, um, what she's doing is patching the cell and changing its, 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 uh, its uh, membrane potential. And at the same time, as shown by this red light, we are uh, illuminating the cell and recording the fluorescence. Um, so, so this is an image of the cell whilst the man is changing the membrane potential. And basically, you can see that with these voltage steps, At each of these voltage steps, you can see that the, the fluorescence is changing. So we're able to uh, look at the activity of the cell just using light. Um, and so this is what the traces look like using each of the, each of the methods. So basically we, what we plot is the, the, the so-called delta F over F. So this is just a, a, a metric that removes any dependence on these traces in the expression level of the cell. So what you can see is that the, the, the activity that we're recording matches very closely the actual electrical activity of the cell using all three of those points. Um, and as I said, there were some nuances between them. So the things that we're interested in when, when we're characterizing these tools is primarily the signal to noise ratio, right? We want a high signal to noise ratio in order to be able to detect these actual tensions very robustly. Um, and in all cases, as a function of power density, the, the spots that were generated using computer generated holography gave us the highest SNR at any given, at any given uh, power density. And that's actually a result of these speckles that I mentioned. So these speckles are areas where the photon density is the highest. And because of the nonlinear dependence of the two photon excitation process on the photon density, we enhance our two photon excitation. We enhance the efficiency of our two photon excitation in these speckled regions. Um, however, it comes at a cost. So the delta F over F, which is the amplitude of these signals for a given change in membrane potential, was the smallest um, for, for each of those power densities. Um, and so this is an example of what, what we're able to do. So this is um, some brain tissue expressing uh, these genetically encoded voltage indicators. Um, and this is the image that we get on our camera when we place one of these temporary spots. What you can see is that in contrast to the single photon excitation, um, we're able to obtain extremely high contrast. So we're able to, to still resolve the cell membrane as shown by this uh, so this is a sample that basically is expressing fluorescence in three dimensions. So if you just shine a light in it and integrate all of the fluorescence, um, you would end up with a blurry picture. But because of our temporally focused two photon excitation, uh, we're able to, to obtain high form of uh, which allows us to do our experiments. So we repeated the experiments that I just uh, described. Uh, with the, the patch plant electrophysiologist changing the membrane of the cell, the changing the membrane potential of the cell, and at the same time we simultaneously record fluorescence. And you can see that in neurons it actually even works much nicer uh, than the preliminary tests in vitro, and that's because these tools were designed to be expressed in neurons, so the expression is much you know, it's, it's very well targeted to the membrane. So all of the signal is coming from these voltage sensitive uh, sclerophores. Um, and now here we can start to do something interesting. So um, this is the underlying electrical activity of the cell. And in green are the fluorescence traces. Um, so what you can see is that we're really well able to track these action potentials with very high signal to noise ratio. Um, and, and we can do that in many cells uh, at the same time. So now using these tools, we're able to precisely record uh, the electrical activity of cells in a non-invasive manner. Uh, and so then we performed the characterization. So we recorded these actual potentials at different acquisition rates. Um, 
And why that's important is that actually the cameras that we use, their field of view depends on the acquisition rate. So basically we're limited in one direction by the acquisition rate that we're using. So if we can reduce the acquisition rate, but still detect the signals that we want to be able to observe, um, we can maximize the field of view that we're able to achieve. Uh, and what we found was that actually there was not that much difference in the delta of F when we have the acquisition rate from one kilohertz to 500 hertz. Um, and also that we're working in what is called the, the shot sensitivity regime. So basically our main noise source comes from the randomness of the emission of photons in the fluorophores rather than any other external noise source, which is something nice about, about a company. Um, and so all of these ex experiments were performed with a high repetition rate uh, laser. So a classic tie staff 80 megahertz laser that is used for two photon excitation. Um, but the, the question was, was, could we use a different type of laser in order to reduce the average power that we deliver to the sample and therefore maximize the number of cells that we're able to record from at any given time? Um, and because the two photon excitation process depends on the repetition rate at the, at the pulse duration, essentially the, the pulse energy, these uh, low repetition rate lasers have much, much higher peak energies, but much lower average powers. The problem with them is that these lasers are typically used for, for instance, uh, machine machining, um, and they're fixed wave lasers at 10 large nanometers, which is generally incompatible or sort of off peak of the fluorescence tools that we use, which have a peak at 9, 40 nanometers. Um, but since the repetition rate is, is over 160 times lower, we reasoned that, okay, even if we excite half the fluorescence, um, we should still be able to obtain a 25 times reduction in the average power necessary. Um, so we tested that. We used these lasers to excite, uh, to record fluorescence from multiple cells simultaneously. One of these cells was patched by, by that, so we could observe the electrical activity in the cell. Um, and so we were able, again, to record these traces, um, but this time using much lower powers. So we didn't quite get the 25x that we were hoping for. Um, we got uh, roughly uh, a, a, a 15 times reduction in power, so before we were using approximately 150 milliwatts per cell, and with this uh, low repetition rate industrial turbine fiber-based laser, uh, we could use approximately 10 milliwatts per target. Uh, and so then the next step was to actually perform these experiments in vivo. So the goal is to be able to read and write neural activity whilst uh, the mouse is, is doing some sort of behavior. So the next demonstration is that you can really use these tools in a mouse in vivo. So this is what the expression pattern looks like in a region of the brain called the barrel cortex. Um, and so mice, I don't know if anybody knows, but um, mice have this very interesting uh, brain structure because they primarily use their whiskers to sense their environment. And actually each whisker is mapped to a column in the brain in a region called the viral cortex. And so when a mouse is exploring its environment and it, its whisker encounters something, there's an entire barrel of, of its cortex that, that it fires at um, And so it's a really nice uh, test bed because if you, if you touch a whisker, you know exactly where to look for the activity. So that's why it's commonly used to, to test these tools. So this is the expression in the barrel cortex. Um, and here's what, what we were able to observe. Um, so basically this is uh, different activity traces as a function of depth in the cortex. Um, and we were able to image all the way down to 240 uh, micrometers. Uh, in the cortex, of course, as we go deeper, uh, more photons are scattered, so the signal to noise ratio decreases. It's not really a problem on the excitation side, because as I mentioned, we're using these infrared wavelengths, um, but the fluorescence is visible. So uh, as you go deeper, basically, photons are being scattered out of your out of your spot. But even so, we were able to record uh, action potentials um, from layer two, three of the cortex. 
for, for reference there are six that you can um, And again, we are able to do that from multiple cells simultaneously. So here we're using these spots to target four cells, uh, one, two, three, four, and two of those cells are doing some interest. Uh, so here we're able to record the activity of neurons. And you can see that even deep in the brain in a live uh, mouse, uh, whose whiskers are being, are being uh, brushed, uh, we're able to record these, these, these action potentials with high fidelity. Um, we also tested the method in, a, in another model of this, uh, which is the zebrafish, which is commonly used in, in, in neuroscience research and, and in biology in general, actually, um, because it's, it's optically transparent. So what that means is that, and, and also it has uh, a relatively small brain. So you can perform uh, whole brain zebrafish, which is very interesting. You can see what's happening on a global level as the zebrafish is, is going uh, activity. Um, and so we're able, once again, to record fluorescence uh, from, from these neurons. So we're able to record the activity patterns um, of different types of cells. So uh, this cell is undergoing some sort of big activity, which is usually associated with how actually a fish um, swim. So when uh, it, its tail goes from side to side, on each side of, of the tail, the neurons have asynchronous activity. Um, and here's another cell uh, that's undergoing this fast spiking activity. So this is most likely a between neuron. Um, and I think is the summary of of, of everything. Yeah. <laughs> so if, be brave. If anybody, you know, I, I won't be offended if you say this part was super boring. We don't want to hear any more about that. Uh, but mostly, like, if you are interested in, in the voltage imaging or the bidirectional um, control or my actual personal uh, research is, is in 3D microscopy, so volumetric. Uh, so that's it. Or I'll decide. Um, it's 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 basically to uh, focus the next part of the talk on the things that are interesting and relevant relevant to you. And so I, there, there there's op, so for instance the optogenetics for neural control. So more basically on what are the neuroscience questions that we're answering. So that's a large focus of, of our lab, or more on the optical technologies. Maybe I went over the, the tools very quickly uh, that we use, maybe like more details on the tools themselves. Uh, so just how deep into the brain you can go, and uh, how this is more or less 
would say, but a very nice question, how do you get this from the skull? Do you have to take a hold of the skull, I guess, or, and how do you target the different region of the brain? Well, that's, a, that's a good question. So, um, so a lot of the work that we do in the lab, um, the biologists perform what's called a cranial hugging. So you thin the skull and then you pop it through glass, uh, which gives us optical access. Um, but actually, a lot of the tools um, now are sufficiently potent that, for instance, uh, some medical doctors are replacing, I don't know, remote in brain stimulation uh, with actual optometric stimulation. So in this case, uh, you don't need to remove the skull. You can essentially use a fiber optic, but this is single blood representation, so it's not what we're out of. But you can use a fiber optic uh, and excite runs in the brain without, and so those blood drugs remove the face. Thanks for Maybe that's a good one first. So, do you see that in a sort of kind of technology or a sense to? For mineral tissue, I'm not sure. I've never heard of, a, of, of any applications, but I don't see why not. Essentially, um, uh, people have been using these tools in cardiac tissue, basically in any excitable tissue, so in kidneys. Um, and one of the most interesting ones that I heard about recently was actually in pups. Uh, so to use these to use these tools to control uh, water uptake in plants. So there's all kinds of different types of applications. So I'm sure why not? Had uh, two requests: one for biology and one for uh, imagery. So I went for the more the most sort of impressive. Uh, biology that I know of uh, related to optogenetics and to think that honestly I think that France as a whole should be super proud of because it's really a pioneer um, particularly the institute where I work I'm, not, I'm absolutely not involved in the work uh, but I'll just give you a, a brief overview and so um, basically in the institute that I presume a large portion of the, of the research is actually dedicated towards restoring uh, sight into light patients. Um, and so there's a lot of different uh, axes uh, of investigation towards towards that goal. Um, but one super exciting uh, paper was published, uh, actually probably now a couple of years ago, basically just after COVID, that showed that they could use optogenetics to restore vision in, uh, in a, a totally blind uh, patient, actually. Um, and this was based on, on the tools that I outlined earlier in the talk. So basically what happens in some, uh, some diseases uh, which cause uh, vision loss are that you lose light sensitivity in your eye. So the photoreceptors in your eye just don't respond to light. So basically then there's no electrical signals going to your brain. So you, you don't have any, any vision. So the, the goal of this project was to use these optogenetic tools, so these light sensitive uh, ion channels that I introduced earlier into these cells in order to make the your eye light sensitive again. Um, and it really is the same, the same tools, so it's the same light gated ion channels and these uh, vectors for, for these viruses in order to deliver the genes. Um, into, into your eye. Uh, obviously, they're tested extensively before they're put in, into, into patients. But they have been tested extensively and they have been put into, into patients. Um, and then basically the blind um, patients have to wear these goggles and they undergo a period of training because um, this is also related to the fact that I was telling you about earlier, which is that these single photon signals are entirely unrelated to the physiological activity that of your brain. Uh, but nonetheless, you can stimulate uh, cells in, 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 eye, in the eye of human patients who previously were, were unable to see. 
um, and they published this video, and I'll, I'll speak during it, but it's, it's quite, um, it was hard to play. But the story is really quite remarkable. So basically, um, they started this clinical trial pre-COVID, and the patients are really not used to wearing these goggles, so there's an extensive um, series of training that the patients have to undergo in order to sensitize patient to, to this new type of vision that is, is being imposed on them. Uh, and so they, the, the French government invested a lot of money into these clinical trials uh, and then boom, COVID. So actually they were unable to undergo, uh, to do the clinical trial, right? We were all locked out, down in our houses. So basically the training that the patients were supposed to undergo to get them used to these goggles, they weren't allowed to do. Uh, and then basically at the end of COVID, this patient contacted the, the, the lead doctor of the trial, so you should say sign up. Uh, and he said, well, I've been doing the training myself, uh, and actually, uh, I can, I can perceive objects. Uh, and so they brought him in to, 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 to assess his, his vision, his, his vision. And here he is wearing the, the, the goggles, and he's looking at uh, the objects of the table. And as you can see, when I say he's looking, it's really far from, okay, he wears his goggles and now we can see. Basically, the level of vision that is restored is that he can now sense contrast. So he can now, so before where his world was totally dark, now he, he's expressing these light sensitive um, ion channels and he can sense where objects are. On, on, so it's a dark object on a, on a white table, but he can, he can reach, out, reach out and touch it. And you'll probably notice that he, uh, his head is moving uh, like this. So he's kind of doing a rest of the with his head. Uh, and this is with the field of view of the camera. Um, so it's really, really far away from what we would perceive as, as you know, or how, how we interact with our environment every day. Uh, but I think it's a really remarkable story of, of the power of these tools. Um, and really just to remember that these all came from biologists studying algae, like how do algae, how are algae sensitive to light? Um, and so we've gone from scientists looking at current flowing through channels in, in algae to, to restoring partial vision in, in, in blind subjects. So it's really a testament to the, to the power of research. Um, and um, the, the clinical trials are, are ongoing in this. Um, in this field, uh, the work of our lab is now to try and make um, these goggles stimulate the neurons in a more precise manner. So to basically try to map uh, what is actually happening in your eye, which cells are being excited according to what gave them. You know, I see a laptop, what's the electrical activity in my eye? Okay, we replay that electrical activity in, in those cells in order to move from contrast to, to an image. So we won't get there too far. Um, but it's a really exciting, uh, I think, uh, application um, for this work. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, end, end the biology with the sorts of questions um, that, that neuroscientists are, are trying to address uh, within, within these tools. So in our lab in Paris, we're half physicists uh, and half biologists. Uh, and I think that's really important. Because as physicists, we have the uh, tendency to build really cool tools, which maybe aren't necessarily useful. Um, so particularly for, I guess, master students, we're hoping to choose uh, where, where they'll do their PhD. Um, just my advice is, is to, if you're making tools, make sure that you're constantly in contact with the people who might actually end up using your tools. Um, for instance, my PhD, I worked in what was called it an advanced imaging center. Um, and I built super cool tools, right? But then at the end, when I built them, I went searching for people to use them, uh, which really wasn't a good way to, to, to do that because the tools were cool, but they could have been much more useful. Uh, and if you are able to have that cycle, so that constant interaction of uh, what the people who are using these tools need, then you can actually make sure that the tools that you're building are useful. And so these are some of the questions that the biologists in our lab are hoping to address, and therefore we're able to make sure that we deliver the tools that, that are able to be up. Um, and the sort of summary of all of those questions is, uh, okay, Ruth, but really what we want, a microscope that allows us to see everything, everywhere, in the brain, 
all at once. Um, and so now I want to switch, uh, and, and lots of physicists think that's kind of easy, right? Like this is a famous physicist, Richard Feynman, who says biology is easy, right? You just look at the thing. Okay, but there's a lot of nuance to that question. How, 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 how do we just, do we just look at the thing? And um, now I'll kind of switch to something that is a topic that I'm personally very interested in. Um, and sort of traditionally, what we've done in, in microscopy in, in general is, uh, is to say, okay, here you've got a problem. Uh, you want to look at everything, like everywhere, all at once. Okay, you need this uh, field of view, you need this imaging speed, you need this resolution. Okay, I'll come up with an optical design that allows you to do that. Um, but maybe there's a better way that we can go about designing. So we're obviously living the age of AI and deep learning, and we have a huge amount of data. So there's now a big switch in optical microscopy to sort of say, do humans really know the best way to build a microscope to look at the thing that you're interested in? Or can computers tell us of a better design, right? And that's called programmable microscopy. Um, and I just want to go uh, into that. Okay. So usually, So usually what we do in a microscope, right, is that we have uh, an objective, have a sample, and we have a sensor. And usually what we aim to do is to get something on our sensor that looks a lot like our sample, right? We want a representative image of our sample. Um, and this new sort of approach in microscopy says, no, no, that's not what you want at all, actually. All you want your sensor to do is encode the maximum amount of information possible that you have about your, your um, sample. And then what you want to do is in order to get the faithful representation, you want to do some computational decoding of the, all of the data that you've collected in order to end up with this faithful representation. So we've, we're kind of moving away from having a microscope that is finely tuned to have the high spatial resolution to precisely map our sample into our sensor to a regime where now we're using something called an optical encoder and a computational decoder in order to maximize the amount of information that we're acquiring at any given time. Um, and as a, a famous researcher in the field uh, put it, um, how and why to ruin a perfectly good microscope. Because actually, if you just look at the raw images that come out of these tools, they look like absolute garbage, okay? I put on a cell, I get something out that looks, uh, I get out, for instance, in, in this case, uh, one of the techniques is called light film microscopy. I get out 50 images of a, of a cell. So how do I go from my 50 images of a cell back to one image? Um, and that's the computational decoding, decoding part. And one of the questions is, what is the optimal way to encode information? Like, how do I decide how to encode the information from my sample onto my detector? Uh, and one of the reasons I'm very interested in this is because in the first part of the presentation, I, I, I told you all about how we were able to generate two forms of excitation from these very well-defined um, regions in 3D. So in, in sort of complicated speak, I have a huge amount of priors on my sample. Basically, I know exactly from where I'm exciting fluorescence. So I don't need to image everything all at once. I need to maximally obtain signal from the points that I know that I'm exciting. So that's kind of a complicated way of saying, just make sure that the thing that you actually want to look at is it not to your, your, your recording? And in order to, to, to come up with this so-called optical encoder, essentially we use a deep learning process. So uh, as with any deep learning uh, approach, we need a huge amount of so-called ground truth data. So 
for instance, the structure of the sample that we're looking at. So let's say, uh, so this lab was very interested in uh, zebrafish. So they wanted to image uh, neural activity of zebrafish. So what you do is you uh, acquire a bunch of ground truth samples. So in this case, it was uh, 50 uh, focal volumes. Um, and then you simulate the imaging process. So you simulate what's happening in your microscope. Um, and the optical encoder is a free parameter. So you start off with, for instance, a random phase risk. So what you have on your on your camera is really garbage. It absolutely looks nothing. Imagine that you 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 you, you put a, a scattering medium between your your uh, sample and your camera. You end up with a cloudy mess on your camera, and so you can't get any information back out of it. Okay. Then what you do is you have the second part of the neural network, which is a computational decoder, and so you decode this cloudy image of nonsense and you calculate an error between what your computer thinks it's looking at and what the sample actually is and you do this many 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 times and you use a, a technique called back propagation so i don't know if you guys have done any deep learning as part of your your master's courses basically you iteratively update the parameters of this optical encoder in order to make sure that your your representation that your computer is generating is as close to the sample as, as possible. Um, and so there's a lot of techniques uh, that were developed in order to do this. And the process sort of looks like this. So I'll, uh, I'll just that. So basically, uh, in this case, what was being optimized for was to do uh, super resolution imaging throughout the cell. So basically, on the left, what you have is what's happening to this so called optical encoder as a function of number of iterations. So hopefully that, that you can see that from the beginning to the end. At the beginning, you had absolutely no light from two or six microns. So you, you're at a classical microscope does very well in the focal plane, right? You can see things that are in focus. But as soon as you move away from the focal plane, you, you, everything's blurry. You're not imaging with high contrast. And so what these guys wanted to do was build an extended depth of field microscope so that within this eight micron range, um, essentially, you're imaging with the maximum contrast possible. And so this was a, an entirely interesting process. I'll, I'll just play that video again. And so just watch at the end. Uh, those are the kind of important things. As the, the, the parameters of this so called optical encoder are being updated, the contrast in these endpoints is increasing and increasing. Um, and so basically, what you've done is you've built, or, or your computer has told you what's the best uh, way to image from, from this range. The best way is by using this space master. Uh, now, the problem that I, I worked on was uh, somewhat, uh, it was at a place called Germany, which is uh, uh, a research campus uh, uh, in the of America. And it's uh, kind of uh, the holy grail of white microscopy because uh, they have a huge amount of money and a huge amount of resources. Um, and so, what they what they wanted to do was work out the best way to do an entire zebrafish brain. Uh, and that is incredibly memory intensive to do this opening process. So they basically have a cluster of them, which is where. But the, the, the idea is the same is that basically I take this ground truth volume, um, I simulate the imaging process with my optical encoder, which is initialized with random parameters. And every time that I try to reconstruct the volume, I calculate the error. I calculate the reconstruction error and I update the parameters of the optical encoder in order to improve my, my estimate. And I do that repeatedly, repeatedly until uh, at a certain point my reconstruction looks like my ground truth. Um, and so uh, apparently the optimal way to image from a tire zebrafish print is using a face mask that, that, that looks something, something like this. Um, and one of the things that was really, really interesting. From, uh, so this is just how that would look in a microscope. So you basically put this face mask in a, in, in a, a conjugate pupil plane of your microscope. And here's the zebrafish. Uh, these are all of the neurons we are expressing to that protein that I described earlier in the talk. This video. So then as um, this is the image that I've recorded in my top. So that's what I was saying. That it looks like absolute trash, right? Like usually when you look into a microscope, you would hope to see the thing that it's something. But with these techniques, what you what you're getting is not that at all. You have to do some complication of the construction in order to get back to you. Um, but the 
information that's encoded in this image is actually much, much higher than it would have been if they didn't have the face mask. So what's happening here is that actually each of these so-called expected views is giving you information about the sample from a different direction. And actually what that allows you to do is a tomographic reconstruction in order to reconstruct a 3D volume from a 2D image. So now we can compress the number of measurements that we take. Usually when we want to do an image at 3D volume, what we have to do is take one image at one plane, take one image at another plane, move, and so on and so forth. You can imagine that when we're imaging these fast uh, processes like action potentials, that's not going to work because by the time you get back to the first plane, your sample's already moved, the interaction potential is fired, etc. Your temporal resolution is too slow. Uh, what's happening here is that all of the 3D information is being encoded onto your camera at any given instant. And so there were a number of questions in this project that I was kind of interested in, which is um, there are some problems with this approach, right? Like maybe your deep reconstruction network is so good that actually you don't need a good optical encoder. Your deep network has just taken on this burden of uh, reconstruction. And to, by the time that you get to the optical encoder, I, I don't know if you guys have done deep learning, but you might have the problem called vanishing gradients, which means that um, the first part of your networks, so the optical encoder, is not really being optimized. All that's being optimized is my reconstruction network. and um, it's, But my reconstruction is just so good my reconstruction network is just so good that my optical code doesn't really need to do anything. Um, and so that was one of the questions that I had, which was, does this approach actually give you good points per function? Um, and are those point functions something that humans would have come up with? Because we have a lot of experience, right? People have been trying to do volumetric imaging for an extremely long time. Does deep learning add us give us anything new? Or actually, are we ending up in a regime where humans could have thought of that anyway? Um, and actually, what was really interesting is that the it seems like the deep network was doing something useful because it came up with a point spread function that looks a lot like a point spread function that was used for metric imaging. So this um, point, this uh, uh, light field function, but it was just much better. Just generally uh, in volumetric imaging. Is always a trade. So I never get anything to be right. Usually, in order to acquire Z information, I lose lateral resolution. Um, but what was happening here is that it was basically giving us the Z resolution, but whilst maintaining the axial resolution, because uh, it wasn't. So you can ask it questions later because this is quite complex. Um, so if, if any part of this, can grab me up here and I'll explain. But usually, for volumetric imaging, we do something called splitting the pupil. So we end up with low NA images uh, of the sample. And in this case, actually what was happening um, was that it was using the entire pupil to generate these perspective views in order to give us the information. Um, so that was kind of a nice uh, result because the deep network was giving us something that we already knew or people had built as a kind of sensible thing to do to do volume vision imaging, but it was just doing it better. Um, and so then the kind of final question was, okay, so we've done all of this in simulation. Can we, can we build it? Um, and so in order to uh, implement these, these phase masks, um, as you might imagine, we have a lot of spatial light modulators in our lab. Um, we use a spatial light modulator, this time in the imaging path. And the role of this spatial light modulator is to implement the phase masks that the deep network has. has um, and so this is the so this is a, um, an image of the point spread function of the microscope, um, a, a, a max projection. So basically, um, this is x y and this is x z. And so basically, every every image of your sample, every point is split into multiple points, and it's the information in those multiple points that tells you where in three D your fluorescence originated from. So it looks very complicated. Um, but it's, it's actually, um, what's happening is that, um, the central point, so you still have information about where the point is. So this is telling you where the point is in X, Y, and then basically in this plane, if for instance, I have 
So the, the differences in the image I had to this point and this point, then I would know that my light was originating from this set thing. If I had this point and this point, then I would know that it was originating from a slightly different set thing. So that's the way that we now can get three dimensional information, but in a two dimensional image. Um, however, there are, of course, always problems. Um, and one of the major roadblocks is that this is already a very computationally intensive right? Like it takes, I think, a week to train uh, the network to come up with these, these phase masks. So we could be doing nothing, but we're doing everything. Um, and so one of the, the, the sort of uh, things that we're trying to do is to optimize the computational efficiency. So in order to do that, we simulate a one of those but actually fluorescence is brought back. And these phase masks are dispersive. Um, and so if you have a, if you brought the point of a function just from a single wavelength, it looks exactly like what you're simulating. If you record the, the point of a function using fluorescence, then basically your point of spec function gets blurrier because different wavelengths are imaged to different point, points of the camera. So in order to, to overcome this, you should uh, simulate with the broadband spectrum of your fluorescence, but then that's extremely computationally intensive. So it's not available to all, all researchers uh, in the world. Um, another approach uh, would be to simulate instance refractive devices. So diffractive devices are very easy to simulate and fabricate, um, but they have these uh, politic uh, behavior. So then you can set me to, to, to simulate um, diffractive devices. Um, that being said, it actually still works. So I hope again that this will play. So this is um, an image of a, of a Zebra fish brain, basically as, um, Scanning and set. Um, um, so basically, as the image is changing, it's just that I've moved in the position of the object. So you can see that the information is being encoded. Um, so in this plane, for instance, um, I'm sort of out of the bunch of my front spread functions. So the only thing that's being imaged uh, effectively is uh, the center. So that's the central pixel. And as I move through, you can see that um, different different parts of the zebrafish come into focus in different in different planes. And the basic the plane at which they come into focus tells you their set depth. And so this is a, a comparison of the image that you would get using the microscope um, with a more classic one technique. So um, for those who don't know what the LSM. Uh, it's, I take this diffraction limited uh, spot that I was talking about earlier and I scan it across my sample point by point. And at every point, I record all, all of the fluorescence that comes from the sample, then I move to the next spot. So basically, in order to generate this image, uh, I have to take something like 256 by 256 measurements. Uh, whereas for the image on the left, I, I, I get that information in a single shot. And then uh, we were able to use this microscope to record uh, 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 So basically, uh, these red lines indicate when the zebrafish is about to come. So again, this was the zebrafish lab. So they're in nice terms of um, And what's really interesting about zebrafish lab is just before the, they move, in fact, you get this whole brain uh, wave of activities. The whole it, it, it's almost as, a, as if in anticipation of motion, the brain says, come on, let's go, we're ready. Um, and so you get these huge waves of, 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 of So you can see that these are the traces from uh, individual neurons in the brain. And you can see that just before the, the fish moves, you get these huge increases in fluorescence, uh, which is, is, is a sign that it's just about to move. Um, so, uh, more or less uh, what I wanted to, to go through. Uh, it's biology and so which it was what it's in And then I just wanted to um, thank all of the, the projects that I, I uh, 
I presented. Um, and then also a shameless advertisement, which is that we're always looking for uh, bright young students to, to, to drive our lab. So if you're interested in things that I mentioned, so that are on our website that I didn't mention, uh, don't hesitate to, to get without them. Um, so yeah, thanks and admissions. Uh, I Of course, yeah. So uh, I think the one that I showed. Um, so the, the 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 goal of this project was actually mainly the, the deep learning part. So the question was, is this a viable approach, or actually, um, will first is it is it computationally tractable? So that was the question. Um, turned out it was. Uh, and then the, the question of, okay, but are these things implementable uh, on, the, on a real system? And so there were three steps to answer that question. Uh, the first step was uh, just from the point of view of, of, an, of an SLM. So an SLM is something perfect. Uh, um, and what I mean by that is uh, it cannot change the phase of each pixel exactly in the middle. Um, and so there were some questions as to whether, um, because of the, the voltage or high spatial frequencies that to generate, whether the particular function, for example, anything, might be some sort of version. In order to answer that question, we just used a hyperscope. So basically, um, uh, we used a double hyperscope system. So uh, the top hyperscope is one, always have yes or no. And underneath a uh, second microscope just to provide a point source of light. And that, in that case, it was just a uh, so, uh, 532 nanometer uh, laser. And the answer was okay, we can we can generate what we can think to, to do. Um, and then the next question is uh, give one of our expressions. Um, and normally, for, for any kind of uh, characterization of the microscope, I function use the recipe. So these are tiny microscope spheres, uh, which are absolutely jam packed with fluorophores, um, uh, ranging in size between 200 nanometers and 10 micrometers. So we use one microscope microspheres, uh, which highlighted these problems with one microscope uh, fluorescence emission. Uh, but then eventually, I mean, Eventually, uh, absolutely. But the goal of these microscopes would actually be to adapt your sample itself because you're absolutely right in the sense of uh, each sample that I microscope uh, would be slightly different, right? And tilted a bit on. So the aberrations will be different. But the goal would be that I've done all of this extensive training. So I know roughly what my optometrics prediction is. Then I put my sample on, and I actually do a bit more fine tuning on the sample itself, which should be very fast because I've already trained the network. So then I kind of have the perfect imaging system for the exact sample that I have. Exactly. Exactly. So very long answer to your short. Thank you for, for the uh, I have um, 
a question related to the how do you take the ground truth of your sample for the training? And so we are doing a, um, even better images to, to, to have a better ground truth. So do you, how do you improve your ground truth image? Um, good question. Um, I think we're actually more in the stage of how do we get ground truth rather than how to improve it right now. Um, but that will certainly be a question for the future. So, so right now, what we do is, um, let's say for a given problem, okay, so for a whole grade of imaging of seven uh, I know that I want to image a single, so I want to know which neurons are firing when. So that gives me a lower limit of resolution that I need. And then we acquire a ground truth data set with a resolution better than the lowest resolution that we know that we need. Um, and again, um, it's, 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 I'm sort of in two minds about it because actually these types of projects can only be done in heavily funded uh, social margins. Like the cost of this project is uh, enormous because just to acquire the ground data, so it's um, uh, basically we lose it calls consistently for a just putting a sample on and acquiring these part by point images that I was describing um, in order to have the data set. Um, one thing that is good right now is that the, the institute where this work was done is very benevolent. So those now data sets are quickly available. Uh, and I think that's really, really important because acquiring those data sets isn't something that each labs can do, actually. Um, but exploring how to optimize points of attention is. Um, and so I think it's really, really important that those uh, labs release those, those sets. But also what that means is that we have to think very carefully about what is going on from the data set, because it actually has to be much more general than the specific problem that you are trying to address. So I don't think we're quite there in having an optimal uh, branch truth because it has to be universally available to researchers about it. And <laughs> um, maybe just in the panels. Sure. Um, uh, do you think you could, if you have a optim optimization of the PSF for uh, you think we can do um, after uh, the processing or the acquisition of images, we can retread them and to, to get them better uh, after the acquisition? You take off your view and with your optimization, we can use uh, we can use. Uh, your optimization on my volume uh, that you made. Do you think it's doable? Um, not directly, but in, in, indirectly, I would say. So, for instance, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, cleaning of data sets that happens actually as part of the network. So, for instance, uh, DNA uh, And that is universally helpful in Microsoft Whatever problem you have. So, so it's part of it is. Um, Thank you. Uh, do you have an idea of the dimensionality of doing those problems that you're talking about? Can, can you quantify this in some way? Um, good question. Um, no, I don't. Uh, and that was one of the uh, one of the interesting things I found about this project is that, um, I guess for maybe, maybe this should just be, tell me if I'm explaining something that's a bit too basic, but just so that you guys are also aware of the question. Um, the, the, the question is, um, maybe the solution space is so fast, right? How can you be sure that the local minimum that you're ending up in is a, is a good one, or how can you be sure that you can even find it? Um, which is a very, very interesting question because depending on where, and it's pretty tricky to measure. So you could just say one way of, of measuring it would be that I take the number of pixels on my SLM uh, and I multiply them by the bit depth, right? But that is enormous. So basically, and um, that's definitely not the dimensionality of the problem because most of the points by functions that my SLM would generate would be total trash. Um, and so one interesting way uh, that some researchers have, have addressed this problem, mainly those who don't have a lot of computational power, is to reduce the dimensionality of the problem and to say a good point spread function 
will be a linear combination of Zernike polynomials. So I only optimize over relatively smooth um, spread functions. So the you know the video that I was showing that ended up with the long depth of field for super resolution that was only an optimization over Zernike polynomials, um, which is a very is a much smaller dimension. Yes, indeed. But then the combination of Zernike polynomial itself is completely space variant. Everywhere it's different. Um, yes, um, depending on where I manipulate my, uh, so so it's also a question of where do I put my optical encoder um, in order to. So for some problems, imagine imagine that my problem is um, I want to form super resolution. Okay. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, in in that case, what I want is for the point spread functions of two points that are extremely close together. I want them to be as different as possible. Because depending on whether I get A or B, I can tell you whether I'm at location A or B. And so um, uh, a metric that's used in, in that case is called um, distinguishability. So basically, in the iterative um, process, the thing that I'm optimizing for okay. is distinguishability. And in that case, I would have wanted to use um, a point spread function, which is called, which is spatially invariant. I would want the most spatially invariant point spread function that I can possibly. Have. So it really depends. Thank you. Yeah. Don't be shy, students. If you have any, uh, <laughs> if you say, Ruth, go to slide 10, it was super unclear. I didn't understand it. That's also okay. Or if you're shy, you can grab me in, in, the, in the next break. Uh, but really, uh, there, there's no such thing as a, a stupid question in my mind. So really don't for me to grab on to try to.